Lex Luger's time as an active professional wrestler is really fascinating to look back on. It feels like, at certain points of his career, Lex really had it all. His early work in the NWA has been praised as some of the best work of his entire career, and he had a true resurgence and genuine, unmanufactured popularity in WCW from mid-1996 onwards. Looking back at Lex's work during this time period on Reliving the War proves that there's many misconceptions out there about Luger. Yes, the Lex Express stuff in the WWF is worthy of criticism, but he was red hot during the early days of the WCW NWO feud. As time went on, and as WCW started to change and go through its own highs and lows, Lex tried to change with the times too. He became part of the NWO Wolfpack, the red and black version of the NWO that also became very popular. But when the NWO stuff started to dry up, and when WCW attempted to build a future that didn't involve its most popular storyline and faction, Lex went through another change. Now, I'm not saying that Lex should have been winning world championships at this point, and I'm not saying Lex could have reverted back to a 1997 babyface and carried the company into the new millennium, but what you have to understand before continuing on here, and what you have to keep in the back of your mind as we look at this character evolution, is that Lex Luger was once one of WCW's most beloved superstars, and that's not an exaggeration. Again, those who join me every week for Reliving the War would know that Lex had an incredible following, and if you don't believe me, just watch his appearances and matches during 1997. Trust me, I too was part of the echo chamber when it came to Lex Luger, but watching it all back made me realize that superstars today would kill for the same crowd reactions that Luger received. No one will ever consider Luger the greatest wrestler in the world, let's make that clear, but Lex was ultra over. He could have been someone the company went back to if they just kept him a straight babyface, but this is late WCW we're talking about here. Lex would get injured at the beginning of 1999, and when he came back later in the year, he said the old Lex Luger was dead while promising to show us the next evolution of his character. The presentation was a little weird, the change itself was forgettable, and it could very well be argued that the Lex Luger we're going to look at today is the worst Lex Luger to grace our TV screens. Ok, first of all, the injury that happened on Thunder. Lex was preparing for a tag team match at Super Brawl 9 against Conan and Rey Mysterio. Kevin Nash was going to be his partner. On the February 18th, 99 edition of Thunder, Luger got legitimately injured when Rey Mysterio slammed a limousine door into Luger's biceps. Luger was taken out of the Super Brawl match, although he still made an appearance at the show. Luger had to take time off, and during his time away from the ring, WCW went through drastic changes. You'd think you were watching a completely different wrestling company by the time Luger came back. Sting was getting ready to wrestle Hulk Hogan on the August 23rd episode of Nitro, and Lex Luger came back to warn Sting not to trust the Hulkster. Hogan was back in the red and yellow, and this didn't sit well with Luger. Sting said he had to take the title opportunity, and he didn't really have any other option. Right enough, there was interference during the Sting vs Hogan main event, and Sting didn't win the championship, but it wasn't instigated by Hogan. Goldberg and Luger come out to clear the ring, Hogan promises to give Sting another shot, and he also says Luger and Goldberg can watch their backs while they have the match. The next week, Luger cut a promo with main Gene Okerlund, and he said he had undeniable, concrete, irrefutable evidence that Hulk Hogan was a con man, that Hulk Hogan was still up to no good, and that Hulk Hogan was scamming everyone. Luger said the evidence was going to arrive to Monday Nitro, and all the fans had to do was wait. Hogan came out later and he pretty much said he doesn't care, his hands are clean and Luger has nothing on him. Hulk says he'll wait in the back and see what Lex Luger produces. Lex comes back out later and he wants Sting to join him in the ring. Luger's holding an envelope and Luger says inside the envelope is proof that Hulk Hogan was pretty busy while he was out rehabbing his injured knee. Back in June, Kevin Nash was hit by a Hummer while Big Sexy sat in a limousine. We thought this storyline had been dropped when Kevin Nash battled Randy Savage, the man who orchestrated the attack, but the true identity of the driver was never revealed. Lex shows Sting what's in the envelope, and there's Hulk Hogan, in an NWO shirt, standing beside the White Hummer. Hogan comes out and he says this doesn't prove anything. Luger says Hulk tried to end Nash's career. And Sting… Sting seems to side with Luger here. Tempers begin to flare, and security steps in. 
And at the very end of Nitro, Sting goes into Hogan's dressing room and who does he find sitting there? The Macho Man Randy Savage. The next week, Hogan said the photo was doctored. Hogan does indeed drive a Hummer, but his Hummer doesn't match the one that hit Nash back in June. Sting and Luger want to discuss the photo with Hulk backstage and the two visit Hogan's locker room. Bret Hart's here having a conversation with the Hulkster. Hogan says he'll give Sting 5 minutes to discuss the photo. We go to commercial break and when we come back, Sting's been knocked out. Luger blames Hogan, Hogan and Bret blame Luger. No one knows who attacked the Stinger. Goldberg, Hogan and Sting were set to face Rick Steiner, Sid and DDP in a cage match in the main event. Sting arrives late to the match and Luger tries to stop the Stinger from joining his teammates, but Sting goes anyway. The babyfaces win the match and Luger argues with Sting afterwards. Lex is trying to tell Sting that it was Hogan who attacked him earlier on. So, we get the fall brawl. Sting vs Hogan is our main event and the big question is, who can Sting trust? DDP interferes in the match, Bret Hart gets involved, Sid Vicious runs in too, and finally Lex Luger makes an appearance holding Sting's baseball bat. Hogan takes Luger out with a big boot and Sting picks up the bat. Hogan tells Sting that Luger was lying all along, he wants Sting to hand over the bat, but Sting attacks Hogan and he turns heel. It was all a big setup. Hogan gets knocked out, he can't raise his hand for the third time while in the Scorpion Deathlock, so Sting wins the match and he becomes the new World Heavyweight Champion. He embraces Lex Luger afterwards, so not only did Sting turn heel at Fall Brawl, but so did Lex Luger. Luger hadn't worked as a heel in WCW since rejoining the company back in 1995. The next night, on the September 13th episode of Nitro, Sting and Lex confirm their new heel status by attacking Ric Flair and by beating Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan in a tag team match. Luger used the baseball bat during the bout. So now we have established exactly where Lex Luger was and how he got up to this point. This is where it begins to get a little weird. Everything up to this point has been pretty straightforward stuff. We can talk about WCW's decision to turn Sting heel another time, because right now we're going to focus on the death of Lex Luger. Well, the death of Lex Luger as we knew him. On the 27th of September episode of Nitro, we get brought into a funeral home. We see a book of condolence with Lex Luger's name above it. In the sitting room, there's a lady with her face covered in a veil, and Lex Luger, <laughs> Lex Luger's in the coffin. We, we then see the ghost of Lex Luger leave his physical body, and the ghost talks to us, I'm not kidding. The ghost of Lex Luger says, Here lies Lex Luger, a fine man, a great champion, but he's no longer with us. The lady walks towards the camera, we then go to the graveyard, the woman approaches Luger's grave and once again, spooky Luger shows up. He watches the flowers getting thrown onto his casket, and then we go to the arena. Before we go on, can we please just take a moment to appreciate the ghost of Lex Luger? This is fucking nuts and it also feels, it also feels unnecessary. Like they literally killed the character to introduce a new one, but it's not like Lex Luger even had a character. He was just, you know, Lex Luger, the total package, all that stuff. He didn't play a character, he was just himself really. This kind of thing works for those superstars who lean more towards the supernatural side of pro wrestling, but for a straight up wrestler with no real gimmick to speak of, it's just strange. The lady walks out into the arena, she unveils herself as Miss Elizabeth as ominous music plays in the background, she walks down to the ring and this all feels very grand. The darkened arena lights along with the music make it feel like something big's about to happen. Is this going to be some sort of supernatural version of Lex Luger? No, he's the exact same. Lex Luger is in the ring and Tony Schiavone explains that the commentary team were told earlier that evening that Lex Luger is not to be called Lex Luger anymore. This is the total package. Nothing more, nothing less. Luger poses in the ring showing off his body for the first time since making his return and the commentators say this is the rebirth, Lex Luger is no more. You're expecting more to be honest, the ghost thing was absolutely hilarious and silly, but it teased something big. Miss Elizabeth's entrance was good, it built up suspense for just a little moment, and well, the rest was really nothing we hadn't seen before with the exception of Flexi Lexi's new muscular body. I don't know, some people may have liked this, but I think the payoff wasn't great. 
There's another major problem though, WCW could have left it like this and make fans tune in next week to learn more about this new Luger, sorry this new total package, but they have him work in the main event, he teams up with Sting and DDP to face Bret Hart and Ric Flair, and we see him backstage before the match acting like the same old Lex Luger, he comes to the ring with DDP and Sting while Sting's music plays, so we don't get to see a new entrance or anything like that and he wrestles the exact same way too, only difference being he's got a new logo on his trunks and knee pads, that's the only difference I can see between the Lex Luger of old and the new total package. The following week we got to see Luger's entrance, he comes down to the ring with a sleeveless shirt on along with Miss Elizabeth, his entrance theme has been updated to the same music that played during the whole rebirth promo, he gets in the ring while a circle of spotlight surrounds him, the shirt comes off and we get a little posing. It kinda reminds me of the narcissist Lex Luger even though it's still completely different, but Lex being obsessed with his body sort of harkens back to his early WWF work. It does make you wonder though, why do this? Why go through the trouble of changing the name, changing the music, adding a little colour to your gear when, in essence, it's the exact same as it was before? I wish I knew the answer, I'm guessing it was all done because Lex was not a heel, but imagine if every wrestler who turned heel also died and cut a promo as a spooky ghost, topping it all off with a name change. I said it before but unnecessary is the word that springs to mind, Luger would continue like this right up until the closure of WCW which means he also flip flopped around from heel to babyface when Vince Russo took control, and you know what it's like explaining all that stuff, so what we'll do now is look at some of the more noteworthy matches that the total package took part in. At Halloween Havoc 99, the total package faced Bret Hart and Luger actually made the hitman submit in this match, something you don't see all that often. The total package had injured Bret the week prior with a baseball bat so Bret went in hurt, a half Boston Crab made Hart tap out, so it should have been considered a pretty big win for Luger but it kinda feels forgotten about. The match itself wasn't good, Luger pretty much did absolutely nothing, he took a beating from Bret right at the opening bell and the only real offence he pulled off was the half Boston Crab, it should have been better. I should also mention that Sting dropped the world title later that evening to Goldberg. Luger would then, in storyline, begin treating Miss Elizabeth bad. At WCW Mayhem, the total package was scheduled to take on Ming. Luger said he was suffering from a bad neck injury at the hands of Bret Hart and he wouldn't be able to compete, but Ming didn't want to hear any excuses. Lex worked the match while wearing a neck brace, clearly there was nothing wrong with him, and Liz was supposed to blind Ming with mace but she had a little trouble using the bottle. This ended up looking really bad and it looked like Liz had intentionally spread Lex even though it wasn't meant to look that way but nonetheless, this started a chain of events where Luger and Elizabeth's relationship would become more and more strained. Lex tried to put Liz in a match with Ming, <laughs> yeah a match with Ming as punishment, that's wild. Liz ran away and she locked herself in a cage, Lex managed to get the key from Liz while she was still locked in, and he promised to drop the cage into the ring later on if he had to, Luger was hell bent on feeding Elizabeth to Ming. Sting walked by and Liz would ask for some help and Sting said no, there was no way out of this. Liz ends up getting dropped in the ring via a forklift truck and Ming has some trouble getting through the metal bars, so the total package tries to hand the key over to Ming. Luger takes a Tongan death grip for his trouble and just when Liz was about to get grabbed, Sting came out to save the day. After freeing Liz, Sting has a match with Ming. Liz comes back out and she tries to help Sting by using the mace but Sting won't allow her to do so. The total package ends up coming down to get Liz but Sting once again saves her and this heroic act leads to Sting losing the match. This kind of thing would continue on, Luger threatened to sue Liz and he presented court documents to her backstage, he promised the powers to be that Liz would take part in a mud bath match on Nitro and when Liz refused, the total package lifted her up and he threw her into the mud. Lex had gone from the total package to the total dickhead. Once again Sting saved the day and it looked like Sting was showing more and more sympathy towards Liz, Liz even protected Sting from a chair shot from Luger and she helped Sting in beating Luger in a nitro tag match, it looked like Liz was completely done with Lex and she had moved on. To make this right Luger wanted a match with Sting and that match would take place at Starcade 99.
At Starcade, Liz, wearing her own Sting gear, was handed a bottle of mace from Sting. Sting said this is the good stuff, the extra strength stuff, and Liz was told to get rid of her other bottle. Liz brought the Stinger down to the ring for his match against Luger, and Liz would help Sting during the early moments of the bout. At one point, Liz runs into the ring and it looks like she's checking to see if Luger's okay. Sting knew this was gonna happen, he was too used to the swerves bro. So he also went through the trouble of giving Liz a can of silly string, not a can of highly concentrated mace. The jig was up, this had been another long swerve. Sting sends Liz out of the ring and he continues the match. He goes for the deathlock but Liz again tries to interfere, this time with a baseball bat. Sting tells her to put it down, she follows his orders. Sting turns his back and he ends up getting smacked across the face anyway. The ref rules the match a DQ but Liz and Luger aren't finished yet. Liz puts Sting's hand in a chair and Luger proceeds to destroy Sting's wrist and arm. This is something Luger would do to other opponents following this matchup. It all ends with Sting getting carried up the entranceway. Luger and Liz would then show up to Nitro and Thunder with Lex dressed up as Sting, somehow managing to look even worse than NWO Sting. The real Stinger stayed out of action for a few weeks but he'd send messages to Luger letting him know that he was coming after him. This would go on for quite some time. Sting was expected to return at the end of January but that didn't happen. So Luger would move his focus onto a new tag team with Ric Flair, known as Team Package. These two would feud with Hulk Hogan, and the Sting return match didn't happen until uncensored. Sting ended up winning the match. The match was contested under Lumberjack rules, with the Lumberjacks wearing casts. The Lumberjacks had all gotten their arms broke by the total package. Boy, that's a lot of injuries right there. And Luger tried to even the odds by bringing out the Harris Brothers and Harlem Heat 2000 as his own lumberjacks, but it didn't matter. Liz tried to get involved, but Vampiro and Jimmy Hart kept her away. The lumberjacks all fought each other and they ended up going back up the entranceway. And Sting got the win when Vampiro hit Luger with the baseball bat. It felt like a long build up with a pretty average ending. There's not much point in going much further because the new blood angle would then begin in WCW and with that babyfaces and heels switched roles and everything that was established previously got thrown in the bin. Luger would become a face in the millionaires club while still teaming with Flair. One week fans were being conditioned to boo Flair and Luger and the next they were expected to cheer them. Flair was fine in this department by the way, but Luger definitely suffered. Since coming back from the biceps injury, Luger had done absolutely everything he could to get fans to hate him and as much as I don't think he should have turned heel in the first place, he done a pretty good job of being pretty unlikable. It was too late for the total package to go back to the old 1997 Lex Luger, so he just carried on getting lukewarm receptions. WCW did try to push Luger again by once again turning him heel and having him work matches at Mayhem and Starcade against Bill Goldberg. The latter had Goldberg's career on the line, but WCW was dead in the water by this point and nobody cared. Luger would then form a short lived tag team with Buff Bagwell named Totally Buffed, but that's a story for another time. The short of it is though, again, nobody really cared. Luger changing to the total package kind of captures where WCW was at this point. They were all over the place with no clear plan on what's gonna come next. We talked about how redundant the character change was, but making redundant decisions was something WCW would do as a whole as time went on. The company had done something with Luger at one point, the same way the company had done something during the Monday Night Wars, but it all went south and people stopped caring, and once people stop caring, it's incredibly difficult to get those people back. Did the total package stuff tarnish Luger's legacy? I'm not sure. I think Elizabeth's passing and the circumstances surrounding her passing may be a more contributing factor there, but in a professional sense, the total package definitely didn't do Luger any favours. Maybe he was past the point of unwavering popularity too though. It's hard to say because after the Wolfpack collapsed, he was pretty much immediately turned heel upon his return. But anyway, that's gonna do it for today. Personally, I didn't care much for the reborn Lex Luger, and I think it's a shame that the company never really truly capitalized on Luger's newfound WCW popularity in the mid to late 90s, but let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching guys, and take care.